It's great to see you. I'm happy you are here. Today, we're telling the story of Jose Salvador Alvarenga. This guy survived 438 days at sea. He drank turtle blood to survive. <laughs> this is a hardcore dude. But before we get to the story, I am inspired by people's will to survive. So, if you want to be inspired, encouraged, or you just want a cool story, stick around. And you know what to do. Jose Salvador Alvarenga, or I'll just refer to him as Jose for the rest of the video, was born in 1975 in Garita Palmera in El Salvador. His parents owned a flour mill in town and he was a very experienced sailor and fisherman. He actually claims at some point that he had no fear for sharks or the sea or anything out there. He was 36 at the time of the story and he was estranged from his parents for about eight years. He had a daughter that also lived with his parents and his parents thought that he actually didn't make it, that he wasn't around anymore. But more about that a bit later. Jose left for Mexico in 2002 to look for a better life and started working as a fisherman and a sailor. And our story starts on the 17th of November 2012 when he already worked in Mexico for quite a long time and he was sent out to go and fish with his boss's boat. The boat was about 7 meters long, it was not a very big boat but it was big enough to do what they needed to do. And on the day that they were supposed to go out, Jose's normal colleague that usually goes out with him wasn't available on this day. His boss assigned another colleague. This colleague's name was Ezekiel Cordoba. They didn't know each other from a bar of soap. Thus, they started loading the boat, got everything that they needed, and they set off from Costa Azul in Mexico. Ezekiel Cordoba was 23 years old at the time of this story. He was from Mexico himself. There's not a lot known about him, but they say he was new with the company, he was a new worker. Thus, he was assigned to Jose. As Jose was very experienced, he wanted, they wanted him to learn from him, and they set off together. They were planning to be on the sea for about 30 hours. On the boat, they had an ice box that was about the size of a normal freezer. They didn't have any roof, so no protection from the sun. They had some fishing gear, a GPS, a radio, some personal equipment, and just a little bit of food and some drinking water. They didn't bring a lot of that because they were preparing for just a short trip on the water. Just a few hours in, they already had like a thousand pounds of fish on board and this meant huge money in their world. This would cause a massive paycheck. But as they went on and as they were catching, clouds started building up and it looked like there was a storm building but they didn't bother too much about that. They weren't too far from shore so they decided to carry on catching fish. But the storm just got worse and worse to the point where the boat started battling, control itself, and the storm just got worse and worse to the point where the motor wasn't able to push against the waves or to just keep them in some direction and the motor actually broke. And this was a big problem because now they were being thrown around on the waves, they, were, they, they, would, they had all of this fish on board and it was raining and thunder and it was just not a very nice place to be. They decided to start throwing fish overboard to actually to reduce the weight so that they can actually steer the boat a bit easier this carried on for another five days where it was just storm and they couldn't move and it was a struggle against the elements. During the storm, when the storm got calmer, they managed to speak on the radios, talk to their boss and say, listen, there's a problem. We think we might get lost at sea and we need help. They said they couldn't come and help them immediately. They'll wait for the storm to calm down. They lost the GPS, they lost the radio and they also lost the motor, which means nothing electronic on the boat was working anymore. During the storm, they lost most of their fishing gear, they lost most of the food, drinking water that they had was also contaminated with some of the other water and it became a really difficult position. Finally, when the storm calmed down after those five days, a rescue operation was sent to try and look for them. But this was like looking for a needle in a haystack. They were a small floating boat somewhere in the Pacific Ocean and they weren't found. The search was called off after two days and they were presumed dead. Later on, Jose reported that they were actually able to see mountaintops there on those two days that the rescue operation was sent to them. But unfortunately, this was the last time that Jose would see ground for a very, very long time. Jose realized that they were in trouble. He thought that they would be rescued somewhere, but he understood that he has to start surviving as because they didn't have any food left anymore of the food that they brought because they only brought food for about 
30 hours. So all of that was finished. They needed to start fishing. They needed to find drinking water. They needed to start looking after themselves. Now remember, they are in the Pacific Ocean. They have no idea where they are. They have no idea in which direction to go to. If you choose the wrong direction, it's going to take you a while to get anywhere with land. Because the Pacific Ocean covers more of the surface of the earth than all of the land masses combined. Thus, it is a huge place to be and you don't want to get lost in there. So they figured out a way to catch birds, jellyfish, fish, sharks, turtles, basically anything that came close to the boat with, and get this, their bare hands. Apparently, they held their hands still waited for something to swim into it and grab it. And this in the middle of the open ocean. Can you imagine the kind of pressure that you are under? Because obviously there's not a lot of fish around, so you had to attract it in some way or it had to come by by accident. So you didn't have a lot of opportunity to practice. I can believe this must have been very frustrating and very difficult to master, but they did it. And that's how they eat. By this time, their drinking water ran out. So they figured out they had to drink turtle blood. How's that? Their own urine. And on the odd occasion that it rained, they were able to collect some rain in buckets that they picked up that was floating in the ocean. And they were able to drink this. They say for the first time that they figured out they can collect some of the rainwater, they collected almost like four or five liters and both of them basically chugged all of it. Luckily they didn't. They realized they must make this last because they will need this for days to come. So about four months into the trip, Ezekiel Cordoba got ill from all of the raw fish and the raw birds that he, they were eating. His body obviously didn't, wasn't used to this. He started refusing to eat and later stopped drinking as well. He became very weak as a result and his condition just went worse and worse. Now I can understand, I mean if you're in that kind of situation, you've been on this tiny boat with only one other person for four months and now you're getting ill as well, that's gonna test you. But anyway, he stopped eating, he stopped drinking and he became very, very weak. The 25 year old fisherman begged Jose to throw the remains overboard as soon as he died. He knew at this point that it was over. But later that day, when Ezekiel eventually passed away, it was too difficult for Jose to just throw him overboard. Jose claimed that this was not the place to be for a 25 year old. Now, wow, in my opinion, this is not the place for anybody to be in, to be honest. So he wanted to give him a proper burial at sea. Also, Ezekiel was the only company that he ever had on the boat. So he didn't just want to throw him away. He started talking to him, started asking him in the mornings, how was you? Uh, did you have a good rest? Did you drink something? Did you have something to eat? Me, me, me agarré el pensamiento cuando él murió y con la misma yo este, no pude yo este, no pude, no podía evitarlo quedarme solo sin hablar con nadie ya hablaba yo con siempre lo anduve muerto como unos ocho días quizás siempre hablaba yo con él y algo así pues, bueno. gave Ezekiel as good a burial as he could at sea he threw his remains overboard and he bid farewell now Jose was completely alone on this raft floating in the ocean, somewhere, on his way somewhere, being propelled by the wind. He considered killing himself because he didn't want to die in the same way that his, that his colleague went. At this point, he was just focusing on controlling his mind, thinking about the good times, thinking about the future, thinking about how and why he wants to stay alive. Check this out. <laughs> Something that I found very interesting is that it's very common across all of these people that survive such situations. The one thing that all of them do is just focus on staying in control of their mind and staying alive. And as long as they can do that, it seems like the human can basically conquer anything. Jose claimed to have seen many, many container ships passing. Not 
that far away from him. He tried to get their attention. At some point, it was very difficult for him to stand because he was sitting most of the time. If he was standing in the boat, it would use energy and it was just difficult. He says whenever he saw a ship, he got the power in him to stand up and to try and attract attention, but it didn't work. And obviously, even if they did see him, for them to turn around and come back and look for him, chances of them finding him is also very slim. So that must have been hard, seeing a ship passing right there and he could do nothing. Well into the trip, he tried keeping count of the days. He was just trying to remember the numbers and, and trying to carve it somewhere, but that didn't work. He got confused and the numbers just got too much. So what he started doing is he started counting the full moons. He got one, he reached 15 of these. And then in the morning, when he woke up, he sort of saw what was going on. He saw what he thought was an island. But at this point, he, he's been hallucinating so many times that he thought, ah, oh, it's, it's okay, it's nothing. It's obviously just another hallucination. And the hallucination didn't disappear. And he thought, wow, but I mean, this is weird. But now remember, he's been on this boat, on this small boat, drifting somewhere in the Pacific Ocean for 15 months. And he saw land and immediately he got new life. And on the 30th of January, 2014, he saw an island and he made his way, tried to move the boat into that direction and tried to get there. And as soon as he came close enough, he dove out of the boat, started swimming, swimming, just going for it. And he made it to the land. Jose was on dry land for the first time in 438 days, 14.4 months or 1.2 years. <laughs> it's rough, it's ridiculous. And this on a boat that's only a few square meters, it's basically the size of a small bathroom. When he, when he reached the shore, he just he struggled to walk, he actually found a house and he realized that the island that he was on was Eben Atoll. This is a tiny island that forms part of the Marshall Islands. But anyway, I think he was just happy to be there. At this point, he traveled a ridiculous 6,700 miles. So I don't think it mattered whether it was a small island or a big one. What if you consider he's been at sea for such a long time, he recovered quite fast. And while he was in hospital, he was diagnosed with anemia. And when he started telling people his story, nobody wanted to believe him. And nobody wanted to believe him because they said it's it's physically impossible for a person to survive that long without water and without food. Even though he said they gathered f uh, water from rainwater and they caught fish from the sea and they said he was actually in relatively good shape for somebody that spent that amount of time on the ocean. And then they connected him to a lie detector of all things and he passed that. Then he started telling us the ways of how he survived, how he caught the fish, how he used this arm. Hear this, he used this arm to lure sharks. The shark comes close, he would grab them, fight them and stab them with the small knife that they had. I mean, it's ridiculous actually. And when the when the survival specialist said, yeah, this, this dude checks out, that's that's what you're supposed to do. That's That makes sense. They brought in an oceanographer. These are dudes that study sea currents and, and they found that if he left off exactly where he said he did, he is actually exactly where he was supposed to go to. So he was, he was right. They, he went on the current, followed him all the way from, from Mexico to the atolls. And after all of these specialists had conversations with him, people started finally believing him. And then the news started spreading all over the world. Reporters rushed in to get the story and everybody was all over him and asked him for interviews and everybody was just fascinated by the fact that you can survive at sea for this long. And to this day, he still holds the record for being, for surviving on the ocean for the longest time. And he says in his own words that he hopes that nobody will ever break this record because it was a pure hell. Later on, there was a book published called 438 Days and that became a big success. And then in a massive turn of events, Ezekiel Cordoba's family sued Jose because they claimed he ate him and they wanted one million dollars from Jose. But now I find this very interesting because they didn't say anything when he came to dry land while he was in the hospital or after he was even recovered. They only came to sue him when the book was published. But anyway, that's not for us to decide. Luckily, later, 
Jose was cleared of all charges and he now lives to be a free man. He was reunited with his family. He met his parents again for the first time in eight years, met his daughter again. They were obviously over the moon to see him because they thought their son went to Mexico and didn't make it at all. They thought they lost him. Thank you so much for watching this video right up until the end. You make my day and you make all of this possible. I hope to see you in the next one. Until then.